Welcome to Triple Threat, the podcast with Jamel President, where it's good news and good vibes all the time, baby. When we left Portugal to come play with you and your system, Jamel, it was the best thing for Shane because you, you, you pushed him to do other things outside his box. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Jamel President and on Twitter at President Jamel. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast as I'll be bringing you a new interview every month. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, Coming up next in our second interview with Barrington Huntley, um, very, very interesting topics. Again, we appreciate... uh, NCAA Eligibility Center for working with us and getting this information to the families. Um, But in our our interview, we talked about um, the NCAA eligibility process, um, transfer rules, um, uh, the recruiting calendars, and also um, Division II has made some changes um, on the eligibility standards as well. And we also covered some things from COVID that that changes and flexibilities um, that student athletes have because of the shutdown. Um, so a uh, very, very, very interesting topic. So let's, uh, let's get into the interview. Again, thanks for coming on in our, in our second interview. Um, but for our viewers that, you know, didn't get the first time, um, I want you to just reiterate, you know, explain the NCAA um, what their role is, and then, you know, what's your affiliation, your role with the NCAA? That's really yep. Uh, my name is Barrington Huntley, and I'm an assistant director of outreach and strategic partnerships at the NCAA, specifically the NCAA Eligibility Center. So the NCAA is the organization um, that really, uh, that really kind of oversees college athletics, you know, through, um, through the membership, giving us that right to kind of oversee college athletics. And and the membership is going to be those member schools, you know, all of the schools that you've heard of divisions one, two, and three. So, so they give us the power to kind of oversee, oversee college sports, really enforce and kind of help with legislation on some of the rules. And then, you know, championships is also a big part of, of what we do, organizing those championships. And then probably the most important thing that we do is going to be um, managing those programs that benefit student athletes um, while they're, you know, obviously while they're at a division one, two or three college. So that's kind of what I do. So, um, and then within that, my role is going to be mainly more in that legislation role. So I work in the eligibility center, making sure that high school, the high school community really understands all of the requirements that um, high school students need to make sure that, that they're aware of in order uh, to, to successfully make the transition academically and amateurism wise from high school on to college. For sure. <clears throat> and before we get into our meet, you know, meet up topics today. Um, Last time we spoke, I just want you to reiterate some things that um, that were in place because of COVID. And if they change, you can, you know, let us know some things like, you know, waiving the text test scores, um, the flexibility um, plus three, um, and then online courses and and things of that, that high schools can choose from. Um, Can you just go over that briefly? um, If those things change and if they had it, can you state them? Yeah, so there was a lot of there was a lot of changes, you know, obviously this pandemic presented a lot of challenges um, to high school education, higher education as a whole. So I think that really forced us to look at look at it, make sure um, that we could put in any flexibility that that would that wouldn't cause a student to miss out on an opportunity for for reasons that were really outside of their control. So some of the main some of the main pieces of flexibility, some of the main adjustments that were made were some of the things that you mentioned, you know, not requiring the test score for, for the current juniors and the current seniors, allowing students to take online courses 
through their high school. Um, you know, there was also in, in division one, it's actually the plus six. So you have, you have the opportunity in division one to, from the time you start your senior year till the time you enroll in college, if you enroll next year or the year after, so that's, uh, 21, 22 and 22, mm-hmm. 23, mm-hmm. then you have the ability to use six courses in that time period, um, to help you meet ultimately the 16 courses that you'll need to get in high school. Um, but going back to the SAT, the SAT was a big one, obviously, um, you know, that's not going to be a requirement. So for students that are going to be enrolling again next year and the year after, the SAT will not be a requirement for them. And then the last one that I mentioned was the online courses. So students, if they're at a school, a high school that's approved by the NCAA, then that high school has the ability to choose any online program for them to take classes, you know, whether that program is approved by the NCAA or not. So that was a big piece of flexibility that gave some of those districts and some of those schools that are already approved the uh, latitude and ability to kind of, kind of figure it out, um, figure out what works best for them. Got you. Thank you for that. Um, in the NCAA process, Barrington, um, what is important? Some important things that high school community, you know, should be aware of um, or know why you know navigating this process. Yeah. So we always say education is going to create the opportunity. You know, I just had I just had a call yesterday with with uh, with somebody that I know in one of the districts that I'm familiar with. And, you know, they were trying to make sure that they were trying to see if there was any options for this student. You know, he had his GPA was below the, the 2.3 that's required in the NCAA for Division One. Um, he had some core courses that he needed to make up. And, you know, he was he was in a he was in a kind of a tough spot, if I'm being honest. You know, is he going to be able to, you know, play Division One? Is he going to be able to live out his dream? Um, but, you know education, education will really give him that opportunity. So, Mm -hmm. you know, making sure that you are both handling your business in the classroom, that type of education, but then making sure that you're also educating yourself on the process and the requirements is also something that I think is really important. So, you know, listen to a podcast like this, or, you know, going to the eligibility center dot you know, eligibilitycenter.org to, to, to figure out some information. All of that, I think, I think helps, you know, when, when we're talking about um, students who are um, trying to make it from high school to college. And <clears throat> briefly, and I know you touched on it, you know, but you mentioned those two words. I want to just bring clarity. When you talk about core courses, um, can you touch just briefly on, on, on what that means and what that is when it comes to the process? So core courses, core courses are going to be those major ones that, that, that we're going to be really looking at. So when you, when a student as part of the requirements to, to play college sports, to be immediately eligible in your first year to play, you know, to practice, to compete, to receive your scholarship, there's a certain amount of courses that you have to take in high school and they have to be core courses, core courses are going to be those big ones that we're really concerned about. So English, math, science, social science, foreign languages, those types of courses are the ones that that we are going to look at on your transcript for initial eligibility purposes. So, you know, you have to have those 16, you have to have at least a 2.3 in those 16. Um, And then in division one, there's another kind of rule that states you have to have Um, 10 of those 16 completed before the student starts their senior year of high school or their seventh semester. Mm -hmm. And seven of those 10 have to be in English, math, or science. So when I speak about education, again, the earlier you know about this kind of stuff, it's going to help you. And then that will help you, you know, uh, that will help you do well in the classroom as well, be more directed. That education will create the opportunity. In this time of session, we got Jamal Edmondson. My sophomore year, coming into my junior year and played for doubles, played over there, 
uh, won the player of the year over there. We came from like last and the third in the region by like one game. Uh, some good teams in that region too. Uh, West Ashley, my kids right. I grew up with, Jackie Jackson, Skylar Williams, Sheldon Brown, Randall Littman, guys like that. It was really good. Uh, and then after my junior, I got real close to Dobbles. I just loved him, man, because like he'd get in the gym with me anytime I wanted to. I could hit him up. He'd come up there on a Sunday, you know, anytime I wanted. It's like outside of basketball, you know what I'm saying? We had a bond outside of the court, you know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't just about basketball, you know what I'm saying? Like we could talk about anything. I could go to him about anything. And then June, after my junior year season, he had a meeting with us and said, hey, I'm going to Francis Marion. Um, and I was like real hurt, you know what I'm saying? And he's best to you like, what did you tell me you wanted? And I was like, an offer, you know what I'm saying? But I'm like, man, I came here for you basically, you know? Right. Now let's get back to the interview. And, and um, you know, when I was in school, um, obviously I didn't transfer because um, there's just so much, you know, you know, red tape and rules and regulations. Um, but this year I've seen something, you know, came into like far as the, the portal, see some kids going into portals. And I don't really understand it, but um, can you explain the, the transfer, you know, rules and how they're changed? Have that any got something, to, anything to do with each other per se? Yeah. So um, recently um, uh, the transfer rules have changed. So in, in how it was before, um, specifically in division one, um, there were there were five sports to where students, if they transferred from a Division one four year institution or Division one four year college to another Division one four year college, they would have to sit out that first year that they were at the new Division one college. So those five sports were women's and men's basketball, baseball, football, and men's ice hockey. Those that rule has now changed. Um, and now every sport in division one has what's called that one-time transfer exception. Mm. So students can, you know, if you're a basketball player and you decide, you know, after two years that you want to transfer to another division one college, um, starting in August, you know, this, this upcoming year, you know, you'll be able to, um, you will be able to play right away by mm. using that one-time transfer exception. So it is a one-time exception. If you wanted to do it again, um, you would need to get a waiver for that, or you know, you would have to sit out. But that's kind of that was the change, and I think it's a good one. I think it brings all the sports together um, under the same rule. Um, and I'll be curious to see kind of kind of what it looks like going forward. And when you said um, <clears throat> you spend two years and, and, and leave, does a does it there's a, there's a limitations on how long it's at one school before they leave? Can this can a, can a kid leave his junior year and going to not would be it wouldn't be a smart idea, but can a, a kid leave from the junior year to you know going to senior year and transfer? Is that possible? So yeah, it really there's really no time limit. If a student came in and you know once you trigger full time enrollment, so you know once you are fully enrolled at the school, you're going to be deemed a student athlete, and then mm -hmm. Any time after that, if you decide to transfer, then you can do it under the one-time transfer exception. So it could be literally the first month you get there till, you know, the last year that you're there or the, you know, the second to last year that you're there, if that's what you wanted to do. And, 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 that, and that portal kind of helped the kid per se, because he's really sitting in that, in that cloud waiting on someone to, to pick them up versus just sitting at that school and then not being picked up. So when, once you commit to that portal, you kind of, you can't go back once you're in that portal, correct? That's correct. Uh, you, you said, or you said, um, you, you said know, once, once, once you get in the portal and, and no school, like, you know, it's interesting. Can you go back to your other school you were transferring from? I mean, it would be tough, but is that a possibility? Yeah. I think that that is a school by school basis uh, gotcha. determination. So gotcha. um, it, it really is up to the school's uh, policies and procedures about what actually putting your name into the portal means for your scholarship and your ability to return. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, that that's going to be a case by case basis. Gotcha. gotcha. But yeah, yeah. Um, on the recruiting calendars, you know, I see something on there. They got the contact quiet in the dead period. Um, can you explain the, the recruiting calendars and um, 
you know, how, how were things were affected by the pandemic? Yeah, so the recruiting calendar really, contact period means that uh, coaches can have contact with you on or off campus. Quiet period, you know, means that coaches can only have that face-to-face -face contact with you on their campus. Dead period means that coaches cannot have that face-to-face -face contact with you on or off campus. Okay. So it's kind of like a green, yellow, red type thing, you know, green is contact period or, you know, contact can happen anytime. Yellow only on campus. Red is going to be the, uh, the dead period where you can't have any contact. How it was affected by the pandemic was there was obviously um, it was a little bit different between division one and division two um, division one there was a lot of sports that were still going on on campus. You know, you had football, you had basketball, you had volleyball, you still had a lot of sports that were going on. So there was a, there was a little bit of a greater risk of bringing people onto campus for visits, those types of things. You had students on campus, you know, practicing those types of things. So to limit um, or to mitigate some of the risk associated with the pandemic, division one had a dead period that spanned really um, from, I believe it started last, either last March, March of 2020 or April of 2020. Mm -hmm. And it only just ended on May 31st. So starting June 1st of this year, um, it's, it's back to the normal recruiting calendars. Cool. Vision two was a little bit different. Division two didn't have a lot of, didn't have a lot of sports that were going on on campus. So there wasn't as much risk. So division two actually had been in a quiet period since um, last fall, which allowed students to come to campus, you know, but not have that contact off campus. Right. Um, so, so those, and, the, and then the recruiting calendars in general, they're very different for every sport. Some have, some have, you know, you can have a contact period pretty much all year, save for a couple days a year around the signing date, but there's some sports like basketball and football, which, have a lot, you know, there's a, there's a little bit more nuance when it comes to what you can do at, at certain times. Um, we do have a wet, we do have a resource called, called the guide for the college bound student athlete. Mm -hmm. You can Google that Google guide for the college bound student athlete NCAA, and it will bring up a, a really great resource that I recommend. And it really breaks down all of the recruiting calendars for each sport so that students know what they can do um, and when they can do it. Hey, what's up guys? Check this out. If you're coming into the Charleston area or maybe leaving at the Charleston area and you wanna avoid long lines and be greeted by friendly, sweet people, go check out Mark over at Avis and Budget Car Rental at 7685 Northwoods Boulevard. When you go see Mark and you mention Triple Threat Podcast, you receive 30% discount on your rental. They also offer compact to large SUVs and vans to rent with quick, easy transaction and check us out and limited mileage on most rentals. So give Mark a call at 843 843- Five seven two three one nine zero. Don't forget to mention Triple Threat Podcast. And does that contact quiet and dead period? Is it um, based on classification, like a, a freshman, sophomore, junior, you know, senior? Uh, how's that work when it comes to those different you know situations? So the recruiting calendar itself is not based on, you know, the class that a student is in, but there are certain markers that the student has to pass before they can do those things. So, mm. you know, mm. a quiet period, contact period, you know, when you can have contact with a student, you can only have contact with, you know, depending on the sport, it might be ninth grade and up, it might be 10th gotcha. grade and up. Gotcha. So that guide for the college bound student athlete, that resource that I was talking about, it really does have the breakdown there. There was a lot of rules that changed in recruiting a couple of years ago 
that um, affect how early or that affect how early a, a college coach can have that contact with a student. So making sure that everybody checks that out will be huge um, to kind of go a little bit more in depth to, you know, if you're a swimmer listening to this, or if you're a basketball player listening to this, your recruiting experience might be, or your recruiting timeline might be very different. Makes sense. And <clears throat> I know you mentioned, you know, there's three different divisions. Everything is totally different. Um, were there any changes to any divisions um, when it comes to eligibility, when it comes to like, you know, D1, D2, D3? And if they are, can you give us some, some, um, some detail on those changes? Yeah, so um, obviously with COVID, you know, we had the change with the SAT, that's temporary. But Division Two actually made a legislative change. So they actually changed their rules um, quite significantly when it comes to initial eligibility. In Division Two, you typically can be either certified by the eligibility center as a early academic qualifier or a, or a qualifier. Those are gonna be the two that will allow you to get your scholarship, practice and compete in your first year of enrollment. The old rules used to have a partial qualifier, which would allow you to get your scholarship and practice, but wouldn't allow you to compete. And then they had a non-qualifier. The non-qualifier, everything is off the table for that first year. So you can't get your scholarship. You wouldn't be able to practice. You wouldn't be able to compete in that first year. What division two has done is eliminate the non-qualifier standard. So that means mm. so that means everybody will either be certified as early academic qualifier or qualifier, which means that they would be eligible to receive their scholarship, practice, compete, no problems. Or if if you fall below that standard, and it doesn't matter how far below that standard the student falls, they'll be certified as a partial qualifier mm. and it'll be up to the division two school to determine how much of their scholarship they get, how much they can practice. Competition is still off the board, but you know, that practice and comp or that practice and scholarship is something that the division two school will have the opportunity to determine um, how much, you know, they're able to get of that. Right. Um, and I have a question, you know, from, you know, last year with, uh, with the um, recruiting being stopped and a lot of, you know, that, that, that class of kids that would have been, you know, going into the, you know, graduating senior going to the next level. Um, <clears throat> is there an, a, is there another year for that class or what, is there any flexibility for that, that class that didn't really, you know, finish the year out or how, how does that work? How, how, how did that work? Yeah. So those students that, that had their seasons affected by COVID um, they do have that opportunity. That's going to be something again, that, that is up to the individual colleges themselves. So, gotcha. Gotcha. Um, you know, I know the fall sports for sure. Um, and then some of those spring sports that had, or the winter sports, and then some of those spring sports that had their seasons affected by COVID um, that, that would be something that again, would be up to the, up to the colleges themselves uh, to determine if that student would come back. There's all types of scholarship concerns. There's roster size, all of that stuff has to be has to be considered um, in that decision. So no, no overarching theme or no overarching rule um, as far as if they have to come back or, th or that, but it's really, the option is there, but it's up to the colleges themselves to exercise it. And basically you guys were going to support the colleges or whatever decision they make that best fit their situation based on that student athlete, basically. Yep, they have, they have, that, they have that right, that latitude uh, to make that decision themselves. In this time out session, we got Seth Wilson. Do you have what it takes to be able to continue to transform your current dreams into your future reality long after the fact? And so I'm always trying to find ways to teach life lessons with these kids and to help them understand a process, help them understand a growth mindset, help them to under understand above the line be behavior. Set your standard of performance here and aim to live a, a like above that line. Now let's get back to the interview. And, and last question on that. Is this something that, you know, like 
the domino effect, right? Because it seems like like the, like the kids that's not in school, you know, this year, they just pass the kids along to try to catch up. Is this something that these flexibilities were, will be going into, you know, uh, is it limited on how long these flexibility will last or it's like a one or two year? I know you probably don't know, but I'm just trying to give a, a sense of, you know, the, the, the athlete, athletes that fall into this situation, what's their time frame of reacting per se? So you're talking specifically about how long the flexibilities will last, you know, for, cause I know you said legislative did division two made a, a, a standard change. Um, other schools are just going to flexibility because of the COVID. I guess once things get back to normal, things will switch back to normal basically. Yeah. That's the plan right now for um, once that's the plan right now. So for students enrolling next year, the year after they have a lot of flexibility that I kind of went over earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but the plan is to go back to normal. I will say when it comes to the test score right now, there is a, it's called the standardized test score task force that has been put together. And that is going to look at whether there needs to be any adjustments uh, or potential elimination of the test score requirement from NCAA legislation altogether. So that's something to keep uh, keep an ear out for just to see if that's going to change. Nothing has come out of the group yet. There's been a few meetings, but mm -hmm. once um, once something does come out, for sure, definitely we can get that communicated um, and, and kind of be looking for that. You know, we'll see. For sure. For sure. And, and lastly, uh, Barrington, um, <clears throat> where can people go to get more information on the NCAA Eligibility Center? And um, a two-part question, if you can. Can you explain... Um, you know, the cost associated with the kids signing up and getting an account um, and when should they, you know, activate those accounts? Yeah. So um, I'll answer the last question first and then I'll come back around to where people can go for resources. Um, definitely, definitely. Um, if a student is interested in playing college athletics, you know, I work at the eligibility center. The eligibility center is the department that that processes all those students that want to play college sports. So if you want to play, you're going to have to register with, with the NCAA Eligibility Center. There are two different types of accounts that a student can register for. Um, the first is going to be a profile page account. So they're, for those, that's going to be free. And that's for those students that maybe are unsure about if they actually want to play college sports or maybe they want to play Division three. Um, as an option, uh, the profile page account is going to be completely free. It allows you to establish a, uh, an account with us. You get an NCAA ID number, which you're going to need later to give to colleges. Um, and then it gives you, it allows you to make a more informed decision. You know, once you're signed up for that, you'll be on an email list. You'll be receiving uh, information that, that's coming through, you know, uh, information about the NCAA standards that I just talked about. You'll be receiving information about how to be a better student, you know, how to manage your time, nutrition, all of those types of things come from just being registered with the profile page account. Now, the second account type is going to be the certification account. And like I mentioned earlier, if a student wants to play division one or division two college athletics, they're going to need that certification account. That one does have a fee associated with it. It's going to be $90 for students um, domestically and $150 for students internationally. There is a fee waiver available. If students, for example, receive free or reduced lunch, or if they receive a fee waiver for the SAT or the ACT, mm. they, will auto they will automatically qualify to receive a fee waiver of our initial eligible or our nice. eligibility center fee. Nice. So that's something to think about too, as they're moving through. Um, but yeah, once they do that, you know, the, the registration process is pretty simple. You're going to need an email. You're going to need, you know, some, some personal information that you just <laughs> upload up there. Um, you're going to have to answer some questions about what sports you participate in, what teams you're on, those kinds of things. Um, and then, like I said, it will generate that NCAA ID number for you, which you're going to need. Now, the last question or the, you know, the, the second question was where can people go um, to get these resources? I think the best place to go is going to be social media for a lot of people. Um, it's mm -hmm. current 
it's out there. It has links to all of our websites on it. It's, you know, Twitter is, is probably going to be the best place, you know, and mm-hmm. our Twitter account is NCAA EC. So it's at NCAA EC and that's EC is an eligibility center. So that, that place right there, it's, uh, it's updated every single day. Um, we get a lot of interaction with the public. We have a great social media team that helps manage that account um, and has really grown it into an account that can really uh, be a resource for, for all people um, that interact with it. So that, that, would, be, that would be the best place. I'll, obviously, NCA.com, you, know, you can go to eligibilitycenter.org those places are going to be um, great, great resources. Uh, We also, you know, from time to time do webinars, you know, Mm -hmm. we have a spring and a fall webinar series that we do. Um, So if you are following us on Twitter, you'll, you will see advertisements for those webinars and be able to sign up um, for those as well. That's another way um, that you can get the information that you need. Obviously listening to these types of podcasts, I think, is a great way to get some of the information too. Um, so th- that's really, those are really going to be the places, the website, um, Twitter, um, and then any webinars that, that we're able to put on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, that was a short and sweet, you know, segment today, which is full of, you know, full of good information. Um, I think we covered everything that we wanted to cover. Um, and, and, you know, kids, this is, should leave kids and families, you know, well-informed. Um, Again, it's, it's always been a, always a pleasure, you know, talking to you, getting information and getting our audience well prepared, man. And um, I appreciate you for all you do and what you do with NCAA and for the community as well. Hey, man, I appreciate that, Jamel. It's always a pleasure just trying to make sure that these student athletes don't miss out on an opportunity. For sure. For sure. All right. Till next time, big guy. We see you soon. I appreciate you. Peace. Yes, sir. So there it goes, guys. Another one in the books. Um, we thank um, Barrington Huntley for providing us with those great, great information that could really, you know, change the lives of student athletes. Um, just want to remind you about our student athlete informational um, that's coming soon in a couple of months. Um, and the purpose of that is to really inform student athletes um, and parents on on how to be. Uh, NCAA applicant, right? Um, helping communities and families make those familiarize themselves with the process, and also increase, you know, the awareness, the awareness and education uh, when it comes to high school athletes, um, high school teachers, the high school community, and also outside organizations as well. I think those things are very important. Um, so thank you again, NCAA Eligibility Center for um, working with us. Coming up next, we got Jamal Edmondson uh, from Charleston, South Carolina, a high school player um, that went on to pursue his career. Um, Talk about his trials and tribulations in the Charleston area, um, things he had to do to get the next step, and it's also a support system. All right, those things are very important. Uh, We'll be right back. What Jamal was doing with Today Foundation and the approach he's taking to help develop young athletes, first of all, getting them prepared from the academic standpoint, which, as you know as well as I do, Bobby, that's the most important element to try to get them to eat healthy, to be able to train properly, to get the proper education, and then hopefully for those who are talented enough to have a chance to move on to perhaps even get a free education by going off to college. But I love what Jermel is doing. It's a wonderful program. Hopefully more people in the community will get behind it and and some of the businesses involved as well to help sponsor this program. Because these are the kind of things that every community needs, looking out for the best interest of the youth. The future of this country is in our youth. And everything that we can do to help prepare them better for that is absolutely wonderful. And, And I can't express adequately enough my admiration and respect for what Jermel is doing and hopefully he'll get a lot of help from a lot of people. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Jamel President and on Twitter at President Jamel. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast as I'll be bringing you a new interview every month. Yeah.
Oxy. <laughs>